Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, whether you enjoy flowers or food, there are a lot of ways to enjoy Mother's Day in this city. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, what happened to the 99 cent slice of pizza? We'll look at inflation, how it's taking a bigger piece of the pie. And how about treating mom to Thai food this year? We'll show you what's on the spring menu at Mei Nam restaurant. But first, taking a big bite out of your grocery bill with a cheaper take on home produce delivery. Save money and reduce food waste. Those are the key ideas behind a new Vancouver business bringing fresh fruit and vegetables right to your door. And for up to 40% off retail prices. We got your attention now, I'm sure. So joining us now is Sang Le, co-founder of Peco Produce. Sang, hello there. Hello there, thank you so much for having me today. Now I said Peco, uh, Peco Produce. Where, where does that name come from? Yeah, peco is actually derived from the word peculiar produce, which is a word play that we use for um, what is more commonly known as ugly produce or imperfect produce. Okay, well, how can you offer food for such low prices? How does this whole thing work? <laughs> yeah, it definitely sounds too good to be true um, initially, but um, we get these peculiar and surplus fruit and vegetable from local wholesaler and farmers who you know, don't have the um, ability to send this to grocery store because these are the second grade produce that are rejected from, from grocery stores. So that's why we're able to get these produce at a huge discount price and then also translate that discount to your customer. I see, okay, but the trade-off is you, you don't as a customer get to pick exactly what you get. So how do you ensure that that's customers correct. are going to be happy with what, what's in mm. their mystery box? Yeah, so uh, our mystery box consists of 10 to 12 pounds of uh, fresh fruits and vegetable. And we usually have around nine to 10 different varieties of uh, produce. And we have staples such as, you know, like your bananas, your lettuce, and also really, really exotic fruit and vegetables such as pomelo. And uh, we understand that, you know, the surprise element is not for everyone, but I think that's what keeps the excitement going because you you feel like you're opening gift on Christmas Day or you know like a, a birthday present that you don't quite know what is in there. Um, but we do mitigate this by you know sending emails to a customer in advance of their delivery and kind of telling them what they can potentially expect in their box. So at least that helps them meal prep or just get an idea of what's potentially coming their way. Okay, so what kind of uh, suggestions would you offer for someone for for a particular mm -hmm. piece of produce? Oh, I would definitely, uh, since we're working with, you know, second grade produce, which usually um, have a shorter shelf life, you do need to consume them a little earlier um, than later. So I would definitely recommend refrigerating them right away and um, or for, you know, for more root vegetable or uh, like potato, for example, than keeping them away from the sunlight. Um, but otherwise, I do love, you know, just putting things in the freezer to keep for longer or, uh, potentially pickling them to keep them as a snack for, for a few weeks too. Okay, now I understand that you're also a student and an intern. How are you managing to balance all of this? Uh, it's definitely a handful. Um, yeah, I'm currently a final year student at the University of British Columbia and PECA was actually started as a passion project of mine um, initially at, at UBC. Um, I'm also interning at the moment, but I think at the end of the day, it just comes to prioritizing um, what is more important to you in certain times. And um, I made that trade trade off when I decided to work full time in PECO last summer, um, summer of 2021, when we first opened. Um, and that was when I was able to, along with my co-founder Ariel, build up the foundation for PECO so that I can return to school in the fall and keep the company running at the same time. But I'm not going to lie, sometimes I don't have a lot of sleep either. <laughs> <laughs> so at what point do you, do you decide to, to bring someone else on board so you don't have to do everything yourself? Yeah, that's a great question for me. Um, when PECO initially started as, as, as a passion project in school, it was a very different solution back then. And 
I knew that, you know, I, I still have a lot to learn and I need someone who can be my partner in crime and go through, you know, like the difficulties of running an early stage startup, which is why I, I look for a co-founder. Um, I was lucky enough to meet Ariel, my co-founder, through a mutual friend. Um, and we actually met online during the pandemic, so we've never met in person before. Um, and we just have very complementary skill set to each other. Uh, that's why, you know, I decided to team up with her. And it was just the two of us for the first, I want to say the first eight months. Uh, we spent every weekend in the summer of 2021 packing produce, you know, coming from a cushy corporate job. Um, so that was a refreshing change for sure. And then when we returned to school, we realized that, you know, we can't potentially just like keep this running, just the two of us. So that's when we start outsourcing to more partner and also hiring intern this year. Well, here's to waste not, want not, and to the future success of PECO. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. You're watching our Vancouver. All right, it's time for one of our favorite features. This is where we get to showcase a number of the photographs sent in by you, our audience. Let's start with this one from Richard Topping. He captured this blue heron coming in for a landing in Richmond, just gorgeous. Bikram Rajal snapped this close-up of spring flowers at a store in Burnaby. And finally, when Warren Lowe saw the American white pelicans had returned to Green Lake, he took this photograph and sent it in to us. Just lovely. Thank you very much. And send us more. It's easy. Just email your favorite photographs to us, bcphotos at cbc.ca. That's bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, this month, Muslims in British Columbia and around the world observed Eid al-Fitr. That's marking the end of Ramadan. Thousands gathered at BC Place. That's the first time in two years they'd actually been allowed to do that. And as John Hernandez reports, it's a face-to-face -face celebration that community members say they are not taking for granted. A prayer that has not echoed in this stadium for two years as thousands kneel after a long journey of spiritual reflection. Eid al-Fitr is one of two major holidays, uh, religious holidays for the, uh, for, the, for the Muslim nation. And, and it is widely celebrated around the world, small or big. This marks the biggest Eid al-Fitr celebration in BC, the holiday representing the end of the holy month of Ramadan. It is really kind of like the prize, it's the reward. You finish 30 days of fasting where you hope that you've achieved, you know, closeness to God and then that you're about to start a new page and then this this is just the culmination of that. It's a day to celebrate with friends and family but this year's festivities have taken on an even greater meaning. It's the first time a celebration of this scale has been held since before the pandemic. I live here by myself and my parents are abroad. Uh, it was really challenging especially last year and the year before that. Amal Usmani says he spent the last two holidays at home alone. We just followed the order and stayed at home by ourselves. We used the uh, internet uh, in order to say happy Eid or congratulations uh, Eid to our family, friends. With many practicing remotely over the past two years, organizers say demand for in-person celebrations like this have soared. It's the busiest this event has ever been, with more than 7,000 attendees, while other mosques across the province saw bigger crowds than usual. Really, really, what goes in my mind is appreciating those moments. Because we have been deprived from them for two years, right now it, even, it means even more than it used to. The importance of being together, not lost on the youth. It's amazing and COVID has taught us like a lesson, how much we take this for granted like the others have said. It's something, el it's something else from everything we've ever experienced. It's a really just a blessing because if you look out, there's so much people and we've never expected this much people. A holiday observed by more than 100,000 people province-wide, many of whom happy to celebrate next to the people they love once again. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. After seven weeks against 127 other small towns in BC, Kimberly 
emerged as the best, according to more than 850,000 votes. You know, a century ago, mining used to be its economic lifeblood, and now it's transitioned to a tourist site that welcomes visitors from all over the world. But it hasn't forgotten its core. Dan Burrett took a tour of the mine, and he brings us this story. Three kilometers in, one of the largest lead zinc deposits ever discovered. It employed 60,000 people and ran for more than a century. We're heading into Kimberly's mine experience. You spent a lot of time down here, Bill. Yes, I What have. was it like in the terms of the transition from what you, you mentioned, old conventional the mining, old man, yeah, mining. Yeah. To, to, to modern. Well, it was, it was quite a conventional. It went so much faster. Like, uh, I, I did the old conventional mining, and then I uh, got into the modern new mine, mechanized mining. It was so much nicer. And Any close calls down here? I had a lot of, yeah. I lost a partner here, and uh, his name was Mike Liza Herka. Yeah. We came to work on the graveyard Sunday night, and... Uh, <clears throat> we, we, you got, Mike got, he got hurt. He, he, I couldn't keep him. I lost him. He had a large rock in his face, and I, I couldn't save him. No, that was my, that was the closest one. Yeah, and it stays with you. You know, I, I've seen some other bad things too, also over my period of time here, mm -hmm. and helped out in some bad things too. But uh, people ask me, would you do it again? Damn, would I do it again in a heartbeat? So I love this job. And from out of the darkness, we head to the powerhouse. Woo! Talk about power. So what does it take to turn this thing on, if you'll pardon the expression? Well, it used to be driven by high pressure water. Here's a Pelton wheel. BC Hydro uses these only much larger th uh, things in a lot of applications. Only mm -hmm. we eliminated the electricity. This went straight from water to driving this, this rope, which is uh, 1,200 feet long. So why don't we start it up? Let's do that. I need someone to push the button though. So I'll, I'll so give it a try. Okay. That's a lot of rope. Makes such a, a, a massive building and a massive effort uh, to preserve the history here. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you've got, you've got a mine that's in the top 10 in the world that's ever been discovered in, the, in lead zinc mines. Our biggest problem when we run our regular two hour tours of the underground in here is trying to keep it down to two hours. You get people in this building and you can't get them back out in it because it's, there's so much history here. Okay, you guys can leave, your school's out. I heard the bell ring. Coming up, India has had back-to-back -back record hot months. They're only just entering their hottest season. Johanna Wagstaff will join us to tell us why this part of the world often has to deal with the kind of heat that tests the limit of human survivability. An unusually early and brutal heat wave is scorching parts of India and Pakistan, with acute power outages affecting millions as demand for electricity surges to record levels. Following the all-time hottest March ever recorded for India, India has confirmed they now also have recorded their highest average temperatures for April. We're talking monthly April averages up around 37.8 degrees for some regions of India, the highest since it began keeping records 122 years ago. Single day temperatures alone, 47.1 degrees in New Delhi, one of the hottest places anywhere on the planet. And when we don't have weather stations to record temperatures, satellites have measured surface temperatures in northern India at 60 degrees Celsius. The scorching weather is expected to stretch into May. Supplies of coal and many thermal power plants are running low, spawning daily power outages. The shortages are sparking scrutiny of India's long reliance on coal. It produces 70% of the country's electricity. Climate change is making severe temperatures hotter and more frequent, with heat waves likely to strike India once every four years instead of every five decades. 
This heat wave is directly linked to climate change. Recent studies show that heat wave frequency and intensity drastically increased in India during the 20th century due to anthropogenic forcing. Another study found heat waves have claimed more than 17,000 lives in the country since 1971. And according to a 2020 report, India could become one of the first places in the world to experience heat waves that cross the survivability limit for healthy human resting in the shade. And this could occur as early as the next decade. India's heat waves will be five times longer in the 2040s than they are now. Heat wave prevention will continue to become a major priority here and around the world. Along with greatly reducing greenhouse gas emissions, heat wave early warning systems will save lives. And now, your science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet and I'll try to get it answered. Johanna, thank you so much. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, Mainam, that's the Thai word for river, and it literally translates to mother water. So what better way to celebrate Mother's Day than dining on a special dish at Mainam Thai restaurant? Well, Angus Ann is the executive chef and the owner of Mainam, and it's so great to have you with us today. Well, it's good to be here, Gloria. Thank you. Well, and we're highlighting Mother's Day treats and that type of thing. What, what, what goes through your mind as you're preparing for something like that? Well, you know, I think about my mother, my wife. I think, you know, we want to treat our mothers well. It's a very special day. Uh, I brought here a few special dishes. One in particular I created during uh, 2020, the lockdown Mother's Day. So I actually made it in my house for my mom and my wife. It's a very special crab dish that you got to pre-order. Uh, I'm calling it the ginger scallion truffle crab. Okay, let, let's get in on this ginger scallion truffle crab. But it almost, it's it's absolutely gorgeous. Very aromatic, yeah. Again, I am just yeah, aromatic, exactly. So what what am I what am it's I? It's gently steamed into? first and then chilled. And I like crab that's slightly chilled so you can get the full sweetness of the aromas. And then we toss it in a ginger scallion and black truffle sauce. And that gets the beautiful aromas, and you finish off a little bit of fresh uh, celery and uh, scallions. Yeah, but it's also sculpture, Angus. Yeah. I mean, come on, there's some art in, in, the, in the presentation here as well. It's gorgeously presented. That's yeah, part I try of the to, appeal, right? Try to let it let it look like it's still alive a little bit, you know? <laughs> Don't think. Okay, what other treats have you brought for us? Uh, we have a tofu lap salad. Lap is a typical minced meat dish from northern Thailand, but we made a vegetarian version with tofu, which is beautiful. People love it. Okay, uh, let me... Yeah, no, I know that in. there's some... I just want to have a little taste. So what is in here? So there's a lot of Thai herbs, some mint, cilantro, there's uh, lemongrass, mm. and there's some... It's this, what makes it special is the rice powder. So toasted sticky rice powder it gives it that little nuttiness. So it's got a little contrast of textures, flavors, a little bit of everything, just like Thai food has. Let's talk a little bit about the um, necessity, I guess, these days, especially to offer vegetarian or vegan options. Well, you know, I think even myself, I, I eat a lot of uh, vegetable or veg-based stuff at home, and I think it's not necessarily just for vegetarians, and it's nice for a Thai restaurant to offer a variety. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have a lot of nice meat dishes and have a vegetarian dish that's sort of a, a nice balance, so I think it's important. I'm getting the fresh basil. I'm getting mm -hmm. the, the herbs. The This is just, it is so light yeah. and lovely, but then a little bit of a tang on the edge as well. Part beautiful. of our new spring menu, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, what else have you got for We us? got a beautiful grilled prong curry. It's called a chuchi, which is a dry style curry um, that you grill and then you serve it on a dry um, curry. Here we have... Wait, wait, just stay yeah. here a little bit long. That You just don't go... So where do you source your seafood from? Because you've got the crab here, you've got these gorgeous prawns, and I know this is West Coast, but mm -hmm. what's your approach? Well, for the crab and any live shellfish, we gotta, you know, we gotta keep it fresh and make sure they're alive. So, you know, the crab is coming from my friends at uh, Fresh Idea Starts Here. Yes. And then this uh, is an Argentinian prawn that's sustainable. Yes. So for us, that's really important to, to preach that sustainability and making sure uh, your seafood is not farmed. If it is farmed, it's farmed with sustainability in mind. So that's really important to us. Nice, okay. And, and what about this dish, this gorgeous? Little... This is a new soup that we put on. It's a really light, uh, hot and sour soup, but with beef. People often think, oh, beef soup must be heavy. No, it's actually a really light. You brace the beef short ribs, uh, and then you finish it off with a lot of Thai aromatics and herbs, and it's super aromatic and light. No, I'm getting that. Okay, that's funny, because when you think about, um, you know, red meats and mm -hmm. that, they can be heavy, oily, even that, but there is a, a yeah. lightness, again, with the, with the herbs and such. How long would you braise this for? Uh, you braise it for, depending on the size of the rib, anywhere from two to four hours until it's tender. Yep. Uh, and then you basically would take the broth that you braise it in, a light kind of uh, chicken base or even water if you want, and infuse it with the aromatics. It's, it's delicious. And what about these little These are treasures? beautiful flower dumplings called chomon. It's uh, made from tapioca and uh, rice flour, and inside is stuffed with caramelized chicken and peanuts and shallots. 
and then uh, they're, they're made into look like a little rosetta, so it's beautiful. And you've brought in the flowers even to go along with it, so a little bit it's of Mother's a... It's Mother's Day. It is yeah. Mother's Day as well. And uh, what about your cookbook? Tell me about this. Oh gosh, we launched, that. we launched that during uh, the pandemic. Uh, it was to celebrate Maynam's 10 years, so Maynam's now 12 years old. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, Thank isn't that funny? Much. What happened to those last two I years, know, right? right? Isn't it crazy? So what would you say, a fresh approach to Thai cooking? What, what's fresh about your approach? I think Maynam's philosophy has always been um, using what's local and fresh to us in terms of Vancouver and, and BC and Canada and try to apply that to a traditional Thai uh, philosophy in terms of flavor, uh, the way we approached the cooking. So it's a combination of, you know, whatever is seasonal, whatever is fresh, and then we try to combine that so the food tastes uh, both local, Canadian, and as well as authentic Thai. That's sort of our philosophy. You have beautiful food. Thank you. You really Thank have you. beautiful food. But let's talk about beautiful beverages as mm -hmm. well because you've mixed something that looks quite tasty right here. Yeah. Look at that. This is, uh, this is made by our bartender, Diego. This is called the Pipi Mule. And we're celebrating cocktail. And, you know, we recently put bar seats back into the restaurant. And I wanted to celebrate that by doing a cocktail hour. So, you yeah. know, before a show, after a show, you can come in for small snacks and a cocktail. Yeah, but when you say pee pee mule, this is it's cold pee pee. This is cold the, pee -pee. I, the right. Thai yes. island pee pee. Okay, yes. P I P I yeah, and everything. Yeah. Well, cheers, cheers to you, yeah. Angus. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I hope you have a wonderful Mother's Day. Thank you. Mm. I'm Stuart, and you're watching Our Vancouver. Yes, yes, other hearts were broken And I know other dreams ran dry But our golden ones sail on and on To another land beneath another sky If you want to go and see some live music, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer James Taylor and his all-star band are going to play Rogers Arena with Jackson Brown Thursday, May 12th. Who am I here? Why do I deserve to see again after all I've done? And American synth pop band Future Islands are playing two sold out concerts at the Commodore Ballroom Thursday the 12th and Friday the 13th. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music here to update you on a band that I shared with you a few years ago. They're called Altamita. They're originally from Edmonton and they use to sound like this. Wake up on the coast in the seventh hour. Every little part of the trail. Climb to the top of the water tower. Hey, but if I jump down, we'll die. Better is in the state of life. Every part of the trail. Full on guitar rock and roll there from Altamita, hometown Edmonton, now of Toronto. That was their ferocious rock song, Losing Sleep, from their 2019 album, Time Hasn't Changed You. But here's the thing, time has changed Altamita. Besides relocating to the big smoke just before the pandemic, they've shedded a couple of members and they've refined their sound considerably to alt-country leanings through a kind of sun-filtered 70s California sound. Check this new one out called Sweet, Sweet Susie. Sweet Susie With your pigtail tangles of gold It's true, babe That this world is long Been bought and sold You can From their new album, Born Losers, that's the new sound of Altamita with their song Sweet Susie, a soulful tune about seeking out the good in life. Born Losers is Altamita's third studio album, and it's filled with those kind of sun-dappled feel-good nuggets that act as a kind of musical intersection between the war on drugs and Graham Parsons. Check this one out, another new beauty from Altamita called Wheel of Love. Turn that wheel of Keep it spinning just for me When you feel you've had enough Turn that wheel of And if they could see me now 
Good time throwback alt country vibes for now times. That is Altamita, once of Edmonton, now of TO with their song Wheel of Love from their latest album Born Losers, which came out in April. Altamita is hitting the touring trail in a big way this spring. They're over in Europe now, and they'll be back to do a North American tour in June and July with the Zombies. Wheel of Love is a song that you need to add to your feel good alt country road trip playlist for this week i'm grant lawrence from cbc music i'll check in with you again soon and coming up we're going to kick off our eight week series of stories about here segments with yute lee by asking the question why are public washrooms so bad in north america Welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, Yute Lee explores the issues in our neighborhoods that affect our daily lives. And today, we'll begin his eight-week series, Stories About Here, by asking why there aren't more public bathrooms and why those that we do have aren't better. This ever happened to you? You're making your way downtown, walking fast, faces pass, and uh, nature calls. So now you're walking really fast because you really, really need to find a bathroom. And the problem? Well, if you're anywhere in North America, that is a very difficult task. Oh. So to be clear, the public bathroom that I'm talking about is one that is accessible to anyone for free. Not if you buy a coffee or a donut, not if you ask really, really nicely, free. And cities across North America really struggle to provide them. They're annoyingly missing in places you'd expect them. Public spaces, busy streets and transit stations. The few that are free to use almost always close in the evening and aren't easy to find unless you know exactly where to go. Case in point, in my hometown of Vancouver, there is just one bathroom across the entire transit system. Just one, located here at Waterfront Station. And you think it'd be somewhere convenient, like, oh, I don't know, the lobby? But no, to get to this one bathroom, you have to go through the fair gates, across a pedestrian bridge, down a set of escalators, through a tunnel, past another set of gates, and if you haven't peed yourself already, you'll find it in the back corner. Yeah, it's a real pain in the butt. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, uh, but I imagine you can relate. This is a problem pretty much anywhere you go across North America. If you're looking for a bathroom, you're better off going into a cafe, a fast food restaurant, or a bush. But this isn't the case everywhere. In Paris, the city of love and lavatories, there are over 400 freestanding public bathrooms across the city. In London, almost half the tube stations have a public bathroom, which adds a whole new meaning to the term tube station. And in Tokyo, public bathrooms are not only plentiful, they are often beautiful works of art, winning prizes and international recognition the world over. Like, oh, wow. Oh, wow, you seeing this shit? So what's the deal? What's stopping us from providing more public bathrooms? Well, to some extent, the answer is pretty simple. It's money. Public bathrooms are surprisingly expensive. Not just to buy, but to install. Each one needs connections to electricity, running water, sewage pipes, and the durability to withstand Canadian winters. This easily adds up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. In Vancouver, the Park Board recently made headlines for budgeting $645,000 for a single toilet, which might sound insane, but that's just how much they cost. Montreal spent over half a million dollars on one of these bad boys, while Toronto got theirs for $450,000. A relative bargain, I guess. But building a bathroom is also just a fraction of the total cost. Once you've opened a public bathroom, congratulations, now you get to maintain and clean it indefinitely. It's a cost that typically amounts to tens of thousands of dollars per toilet every year. 
and it makes sense. If you think your three roommates can't keep a toilet clean, try uh, hundreds to thousands of different people every day. But money isn't the whole story. After all, we justify high costs for plenty of other things, many of them arguably less useful than a bathroom. There's another issue here. The truth of the matter is that public bathrooms can be more than just places to use the toilets. According to a research paper from the University of Toronto, vandalism, drug use, and sexual activity are named as leading reasons for the closure of existing public toilets and the reluctance to provide additional ones. I don't think that should surprise too many people. Public bathrooms can be kind of gritty, and sometimes they are the scene of serious incidents. In 2018, there were 23 overdose deaths recorded in public bathrooms across British Columbia. Those are genuine concerns many people have about public bathrooms. And in some cities, that has led to an interesting solution. Allow me to introduce you to the APT, the Automated Public Toilet. It's a sensor-filled, button-activated robot toilet from the future. This toilet cleans itself after each use, while the structure enforces a time limit for how long you can stay inside it. On top of that, many of these toilets are built by private corporations who pay for these toilets by selling advertising on them. That's right, your flush is now brought to you by neoliberalism. So with APTs, corporations take care of the cost, while technology makes sure these bathrooms are used as intended. Problem solved, right? Well, perhaps in theory, but in practice, these APTs have been anything but perfect. It turns out the automatic cleaning system is still no match for a human being that's determined to make a mess, and relying on corporations to provide them often means they get the bare minimum amount of maintenance. What you often end up with instead is a very expensive toilet with all the same issues of a traditional one. Case in point, Seattle. After spending over $5 million on five APTs, the city eventually shut them all down because they were filthy and not being used as intended. The bathrooms themselves ended up being sold on eBay. So at this point, I would understand if you thought it was basically impossible to provide a usable public bathroom. But hear me out, I don't think that's actually the issue here. There's something I began to notice while putting this video together. Public bathrooms are gritty because they are rarely well-maintained. I looked into this. A typical public bathroom gets cleaned once to twice a day. Meanwhile, a bathroom in a restaurant, which limits its use to its patrons, gets cleaned up to 10 times a day and is constantly supervised. The results really speak for themselves. So at the end of the day, it really does come down to money. High quality public bathrooms are absolutely possible through frequent maintenance and cleaning. But cities just don't seem to prioritize this. And why is that? Well, I think that's where we get to the very root of this issue. In most cities, there are laws that require certain businesses to provide bathrooms for customers. Typically, those businesses are restaurants, cafes, and gas stations. That has created a de facto network of bathrooms and businesses across the city that can be accessed by the public. And because of that, cities have been able to offload much of the responsibility of taking care of our private business to the private sector. That is an inconvenient system, sure, but for most of us, it's ultimately one that we can tolerate. Uh, we have bathrooms in our homes, in our workplaces, and in a pinch, inside a business. Public bathrooms are a nice to have, but not a necessity. I think this is ultimately why public bathrooms suck in North America. Cities here develop with the understanding that toilets are a private responsibility, and that has allowed governments to put in the bare minimum amount of effort into providing the public ones. But this creates a disturbing dynamic, because most of us have access to clean private bathrooms while our public bathrooms tend to be disgusting. That has led many to stigmatize public bathrooms and those who use them, which makes the problem much worse. It turns out one of the biggest barriers to building a public bathroom is actually because neighboring businesses and residents actively resist them being built nearby. It's not that they don't want public bathrooms, they don't want the people associated with them. The truth is, we have a pretty long history of finding ways to exclude underprivileged groups of people from certain public areas, like these benches that keep you from lying down on them, or these heat vents with spikes. Our lack of public bathrooms is sadly a part of this tradition. Urban theorist Mike Davis argues that public toilets are the real front line of the city's war on the homeless. But I can't stress this enough. 
That approach has widespread consequences. Children, pregnant people, senior citizens, and those with certain medical conditions need to use bathrooms frequently. For them, a lack of public bathrooms can be a huge barrier to leaving their home. Professions like taxi drivers, food delivery workers, and local urban planning videographers suffer from a lack of public toilets too. The average person pees six to eight times a day, so it's really not practical for workers in these industries to pay for a coffee or a donut every time they have to relieve themselves. Many taxi and Uber drivers report peeing in bottles instead to get through the day. But perhaps the most seriously affected are the homeless. For them, a public bathroom is really the only reliable option they have to relieve themselves and practice basic hygiene. When there are none available, they often have no other choice but to relieve themselves on the street. And that can have widespread implications. In San Diego, an outbreak of hepatitis A that killed 25 people was linked back to fecal matter in public places. A grand jury report investigating the outbreak found that the primary problem was that the homeless did not have access to public toilets. For me, this highlights a huge flaw with our current system. By relying on businesses to provide bathrooms for the public, we have created serious gaps for those who need public bathrooms the most, all while creating a public health risk for everyone. And it's not that businesses don't have a role to play in providing bathrooms. Like, yeah, if you have a space that convenes lots of people together, you probably should have a bathroom available. But if that logic applies to a restaurant or a gas station, why shouldn't it apply to a transit station or a public space? It doesn't matter where you are. When you have to go, you have to go. In those moments, you realize that bathrooms are a necessity. So maybe it's about time we started treating them that way. Hi, this is Matt, and this is Grit, and I'm Jen, and we're with Stanley Park Horse Drawn Tours, and you're watching our Vancouver. Coming up, why 99 cent slices of pizza are a thing of the past, even when the competition is hot. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now there was a time in the 90s and the early 2000s where you could actually get a 99 cent slice of pizza pretty much anywhere downtown. But now inflation is keeping prices high, even in the face of hot competition. Well, Rafferty Baker brings us that story. The pineapple is particularly uh, bad right now. Glenn Deck has been selling slices in Vancouver since the late 90s. He says his pineapples have more than doubled in cost in the last year. You know, my tomatoes for the sauce, they've gone up by, was paying $32 a case. Now I'm paying $43 a case. When he opened Pizza 2001 on Dunsmuir Street downtown, it was a different story. Everybody had to, uh, to come down to a dollar a slice to compete. And there were a lot of pizza shops. There was like a pizza shop on every block, it seemed like at the time. You could get a 93 cent slice for a loony after tax. He had a competitor right next door, constantly keeping him on his toes. It's long gone now. And Pizza 2001 is one of the last survivors from that era. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we were really busy. It was, uh, it was a different, it was definitely a different time. During the pandemic, Deck stayed open, but downtown emptied and he lost about 80% of his business. He laid off his staff and he and his wife have been keeping the shop open all by themselves. Before the inflation was the main um, kind of topic that was in the news cycle, um, we internally as a restaurant industry, we're all grappling with labor. Business has started coming back, but the price of ingredients and supplies is skyrocketing. Deck says his flour is up 30% in the last year. Cheese is up 6%. Absolutely everything. I mean, you know, napkins, paper plates, uh, produce, you know, everything I buy 
there's nothing you can do but really just raise your prices incrementally and hope that uh, it doesn't affect business. Dex says since the dollar slices, he's had to inch his prices up every two or three years. In the past year alone, he's had to do two price hikes. His cheapest slices are now 350. It's difficult. There's so much uncertainty right now. I don't. I can't tell you. I can't tell you what's going to happen to the business in a year. Deck was on a five-year retirement plan before the pandemic, but that's no longer possible. I just keep looking and seeing my retirement getting farther and farther and farther away. <laughs> you know. But in the meantime, people are still hungry for pizza. And Glenn Deck is still happy to dish it out. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Vancouver. Hi, I'm Jens from Denmark. You're watching our Vancouver. Now, with gasoline prices still hovering around $2 a litre, it may be difficult for many of us to recall a time when that cost less than 30 cents. That's what it was during a price war in 1982. Here's Eve Savory with that report. It's a war that seems to have only one clear winner, the consumer. Just excellent. Oh, it's good, it's great. For the retailer, the constantly changing prices are a crushing bore. It gets to be a hassle, uh, changing the sign mainly and the pumps, uh, you know, it's a lot of work. And the companies, they're losing money especially Turbo, the Canadian independent already fighting for its corporate life. It hurts, it smarts, but we're going to survive somehow. So why the war? Because in the first nine months of this year, gas consumption dropped 10% across the country. That's left companies with a large and expensive inventory and a smaller market to peddle it to. The market is a, is a smaller pie than it was in the past, and everybody is in the trenches scrambling for... A, uh, the same volume that they had in the past. They need to keep up the volume, partly because the costs of running a refinery are fixed. The more they can produce, the less it costs per product. It's a soft market. The total demand is down. If someone gets an extra 1%, it comes right out of someone else's hide. Except none of the companies are getting that extra 1%. Most consumers can't store gas the way they can soap when it's on sale. Are you selling more gas, though? No, we're not. No more, no less. Just the same amount, I'd say. Nonetheless, no company wants to keep its prices high when all around are lowering theirs. So it's likely that as long as demand stays low, the price wars will continue. Eve Savory, CBC News, Edmonton. When we bring you these stories here at CBC Vancouver, we have award-winning photographers out capturing the images that say so much. Still images can add context and bring a lot more to the understanding of an event or an issue. So here are some of the latest images from what happened this past week. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. Bye-bye for now.